If you want to build a guitar from scratch or even from a kit, stick around. I've started this guitar as part of the unofficial Great Guitar Build-Off and I'll be continuing on shaping and building the neck. I'll be going step by step and I'll try and show different techniques using tools that are relatively accessible, not just to professionals. So join me, let's build a guitar. Hi, I'm Yoav and this is the Electric Luthier. In the last two parts of this build, I tested out and built a prototype for the body. After that, I got started with the neck using a two-piece dark mahogany blank which is already cut to the correct size and general shape and a fretboard I cut from the same material as I'm using for the body. I ended up topping the glue and the rosewood powder with a bit more glue as it shrunk more than I expected. I think I should have had a larger ratio of rosewood dust mixed with the glue. I'll see how it came out after sanding it and more importantly after I radius it. Worst case scenario, I'll have to drill and touch it up. The drying time is the real hassle here because carpenter's glue is no fun to sand if it hasn't hardened enough and it takes a while when it's thick. After sanding, I actually like the non-uniform organic look the dots themselves have and I think I'll be able to get away with the thickness after the radiusing. I also hope the flow of the dots will be clear enough with the frets and strings and will not just look random. In the past, I've radiused the fretboard before gluing it to the neck. This way, in case of an accident or a mistake, I can switch the fretboard and don't need a brand new neck as well. This time, because of the chipped strip of the fretboard, I'm afraid the radius block will not ride the fretboard evenly. I've also realized that the material may not be as strong as I initially thought, so gluing it to the neck will give it some firmness as well. But before I glue it, I'd like to do some more work on the neck while it's still flat. My next step is to shape the back of the neck. I'm aiming for a neck which is 21 millimeters or 0.82 inches thick at the first fret, including the fretboard, and 22 millimeters which is 0.86 inches at the heel. This means that without my 6.5 millimeters fretboard or let's say 6 millimeters or 0.24 inches after radiusing and sanding I'll need 15 millimeters which are 0.59 inches at the first fret and 16 millimeters or 0.63 inches at the heel. So much for all the numbers. I mark them on the next side and also mark the heel shape on the body side and the volute so I don't overdo it with the rounding of the back. Even before I get to the shaping itself, I need to give the back of the neck a very slight slope of just one millimeter or 0.04 inches. Once I have this slope done, I'll be able to evenly remove the material while maintaining the desired slope. I'm going to use this slide jig I've originally built for routing the truss rod to gradually shave off just one millimeter at the headstock area with, well, nothing around the heel. I'll use my ruler as a one millimeter shim at the top and also put a 0.4 millimeter card from the super glue package, if you must know, to prevent the jig from sagging in the middle. It wasn't designed to hang unsupported. I'll clamp it only on the heel side to work as a kind of a hinge and enable some side motion at the headstock side. You'll see it in a bit. I'll be using the widest straight bit I have with a quarter inch shaft and will not use the bearing here at all. It's just going to sit there. 
I put the trimmer in my starting position and let the blade just sit on the neck and then tighten it. I don't need to remove any material at this point. I'll start moving towards the headstock with gentle motion and no pressure at all, just the weight of the trimmer itself. After the initial line, I can see that I have the desired one millimeter step before the volute and I start going back and forth while slowly and carefully turning the jig to both sides to rub the full width of the neck. After I've covered the whole area, I give it a slight sanding just to even out a couple of spots and check it with a straight edge. I've seen plenty of real luthiers using Japanese rasp saw to do most of the shaping. These tools are not that expensive, I think it's around 30 or 40 dollars, but I honestly don't trust myself to achieve the level of smoothness and evenness with manual tools. I could probably get there with enough practice, but I'm just too lazy and I always look for easier ways. Easier for me, that is. If you're interested in guitar building and like this, don't be shy. Hit the subscribe button below and top it off with a little bell and you'll get notified when my next videos comes out. I also welcome you to my website, theelectricluthier.com with much more theory and articles on the subject. The reason I've kept the template on the neck for so long is that I'm going to use this one inch radius round over bit to round the back of the neck. And I need the extra thickness for the bearing to ride on. This gives me an excellent C shape right off the bat. And if I want to, I can refine even more the shape afterwards. I mark my limits with some yellow tape because the one inch radius can easily remove too much material from under the neck so less is safer here. Speaking of safety this is a good place to mention using some safety equipment for your nose, mouth, eyes and ears. The dust, flying chips and noise of routers, especially old ones, can be pretty brutal. Now whenever stability is an issue, I'll prefer the table mounted router. And I start with small gentle strokes to get the hang of the piece of mahogany I have at hand. I check it for smoothness, chipping, and to see how far I can go into the heel and the volute, and then I go all in and give a few passes on each side. Notice that I don't have a guard here and I'm using the bearing as my guide. If you're fairly new to working with a router, this does require extra care. Most importantly, pay attention to always push against the direction of the rotation of the blade. My rule of thumb is that you want to feel resistance when pushing, otherwise the blade can pull your hand towards the blade and send your guitar neck flying. Now, Getting hurt is not part of the process. After the first pass on both sides, I've removed the bulk of the material and I want to check the result. I will then want to adjust the blade height to achieve the exact neck thickness. You can notice that my bearing here is right on the edge, so if I want to use this neck template in the future, I'll surely transfer it or glue it to another copy to get a much thicker template for both comfort and durability. The routing leaves a ridge running along the back. It's narrow at the headstock side and about 13 millimeters wider towards the heel. I find the spoke shaver the ideal tool to remove it, but any other type of small plane scraper or file can do the work as well. I'll be careful with rasps of sorts here as the round areas are already fairly smooth and we don't want to damage them. The volute will get much more attention later after I have the front of the headstock shaped and the heel will receive its share of personal attention when the body is ready and I can match them. When the bulk of the material is removed 
I give it some light sanding with a hundred grit paper and that's pretty much done. I'll get to the fine sanding after the rest of the shaping is done. Time to say goodbye to both the fretting template and the neck template. They have served me well. It's well worth noting that different masking tape colors and types also refer to different recommended times for removal. And if keeping them on for a longer time, as I have, removal may be harder than intended. I'm using this still scraper so I don't need to apply force and risk breaking the templates or the fretboard. Before I glue the fretboard, I noticed I've routed the truss rod channel all the way to the back of the heel for no particular reason. Guess I was too focused on the headstock side. I'll use a piece I have left over from the neck and cut it to fit. Before getting to gluing the fretboard, make sure to properly mark the center line. Fortunately, both my neck, which is made from two pieces, and the fretboard have a built-in center line. I do mark 8 millimeters after the 24th fret on the back of the fretboard because that's where it's going to be cut with the neck. I put a tape to cover the truss rod. I'm actually not sure why this is necessary since it's already shrink wrapped and other than stopping the rattling when the truss rod has no tension shouldn't really make much of a difference. But everybody does it so why not? Now I apply a generous amount of glue and spread it nicely. I do it on the neck as well and then I'll align them. I'll cut the extra part of the fretboard at the heel side, the extra bit at the headstock and of course the sides after it's been glued and dried. This is the point when I bang my head against something because once again I only notice while editing that I forgot to remove the tape from the truss rod and glued right over it. Let's hope that it will not compromise the connection and the overall strength of the neck. One of the known problems when gluing the fretboard is slippage. When applying pressure, the two parts tend to slide off the center line. There are two common methods to deal with this. One is what I call the pin method where an invisible pin is inserted either in and under two fret slots or from the bottom side of the fretboard and into the neck. These little pins avoid sideways motion when gluing and applying pressure. Some factories do this as well. Maybe I'll show it on my next build. The second method which I will use is what I call the patience method. It involves positioning the fretboard and lightly tightening just two clamps to begin with, one near the heel and one at the headstock side. The low pressure should be enough to hold the fretboard in place but without slipping and the idea is that after a few minutes the glue will become tacky enough that the pressure can be increased as well as the addition of more clamps without causing any slippage. I'm adding three more clamps and using a neck rest I built a while ago. I added a couple of steps to it so that aside from the middle one I can put two more clamps on the sides. I'm clamping the whole thing to a thick beam so the neck itself adds to better even the pressure on the fretboard. If you were not patient enough like myself you will just need to loosen the clamps and repeat. Once tight, just leave it to dry. Join me on the next part of this great guitar unofficial build-off build. While the glue is drying, I'll be linking all those tools and accessories I'm using or equivalents in the description below for your convenience. Now, some of these are affiliate links, so if you do end up buying through my link, I'll be getting a small commission at no extra cost for you and that will make me happy and motivated to keep doing these videos. Until then, 
If you'd like more information on guitar building, please subscribe below and don't forget the little bell to get notified when my next video comes out. And definitely check out theelectricluthier.com with dozens of articles I wrote about guitar building. But don't just read it, go build a guitar!